Well, we're used to seeing fields where crops flourish and provide abundant food, so this is nothing new to us. Nonetheless, other crops are also cultivated in urban areas. Still, we're left wondering, between urban and rural farming, which crops do best? Listen in as we dive deeper into the nuances of this topic. So, what do we know about crops that thrive in cities rather than on farms? Cucumbers, potatoes, and lettuce can have yields up to four times higher when grown in urban rather than rural regions. According According to new research, an important finding for the future of farming, it is currently estimated that 15 to 20 percent of world food is cultivated in cities, including 5 to 10 percent of all legumes, vegetables, and tubers. However, we need a lot more data to determine whether or not booming cities can support themselves. As city life becomes more popular around the world, the researchers wanted to look into the practicality of urban agriculture as a means of boosting food security, resilience, and sustainability. Despite its growing popularity, there is still a lot we don't know about urban agriculture, such as whether yields are comparable to conventional agriculture or even what crops are usually produced, says environmental scientist Florian Payne of Lancaster University. University in the United Kingdom. The team was able to obtain some solid answers by analyzing 200 prior studies, which included 53 different nations and more than 2,000 data points. Importantly, the analysis included both gray locations, such as roadways and rooftops, and green spaces, such as parks and allotments. There was no clear winner in terms of which urban spaces work best for crop growing. However, the research shows that certain crops are particularly well suited to certain methods of cultivation. Watery foods, such as tomatoes and leafy greens, for example, produce excellent yields in hydroponic conditions where water replaces soil. Moving on, more details concerning the crops that thrive well in cities. The researchers discovered that foods like lettuce, kale, and broccoli are more suited to vertical cultivation. The study also revealed that certain types of products would fare better than others in urban farming. Surprisingly, there were few changes in overall yields between indoor and outdoor green spaces, but there were clear disparities in crop type appropriateness to different gray spaces, Payne explains. You can't exactly stack apple trees in a 5 or 10 layer high growth chamber, but we did locate one study that did grow wheat stacked up like that. What is unknown is how cost effective urban farming is compared to rural farming. Both the expense of running climate control conditions for growing food and the cost of hiring any necessary employees are variables to consider. Developing urban agriculture could be advantageous in various ways, from better preparing for the next pandemic to lowering the environmental cost of food production. We now have some real statistics on how viable it is. Further research might look into how readily particular urban farming practices can be scaled up and how city pollution affects crop quality. There's still a lot to discuss Discover, but this is a good place to start. This is the first stage, Payne explains. That's the power of this data set for planners and politicians to determine if investing in rooftop gardens or greenhouses, for example, is worthwhile or if hydroponic systems would be better. Following that, butterfly that was once extinct in the UK has made a remarkable comeback. The huge blue butterfly is one of Europe's most endangered insects, but thousands have been spotted in southwest England this summer. The Royal Entomological Society spearheaded the long-term conservation endeavor. According to scientists, the success story demonstrates how endangered animals can be saved. Many additional rare species benefited from the conservation efforts at roughly 40 different places in Somerset and the Cotswolds. In the United Kingdom, the huge blue was declared extinct in 1979. Caterpillars were sent from Sweden four years later. In an attempt to re-establish the species in England, David Simcox, a research ecologist on the team that restored the butterfly in 1983, said it was very sad satisfying to see them prospering now. I didn't have a single gray hair when I began. It's all gray now, he told BBC News. Mr. Simcox and his colleague, Oxford University professor Jeremy Thomas, did not anticipate such success in the 1980s. There is hope, Mr. Simcox continued. But the first 10 years were challenging since the national population was under 10,000 eggs. In contrast, conservationists counted 750,000 huge blue butterfly eggs this summer. They estimated that 20,000 butterflies flew from those, making the southwest of England the largest known European colony. Conservationists focused on rehabilitating a sort of wild meadowland where the huge blue prefers to reside during the project. Well, what are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comments. Next up, false autumn may cause problems for Devon animals. Because of the recent hot weather, trees have begun losing their leaves around two months early, according to the Devon Wildlife Trust. It further stated that common wild meals for birds and mammals might have already been depleted, despite recent rain. Staff advised that residents should leave out a regular water supply
supply in gardens and high energy foods to help wildlife. According to the trust, some trees abandon their usual cycle and close down prematurely in an attempt to survive by conserving water and energy. The organization said it found indications of false autumn at several of its 60 sites, adding that young trees, which lack the deep roots of older trees, were vulnerable because they couldn't get water as quickly. Berries and nuts have appeared much sooner than typical, with many being smaller and less luscious than usual. It could mean that animals, particularly dormice, cannot store up their stocks of body fat before the approach of winter and hibernate, according to the trust. The trust's Steve Hussey stated, For our wildlife, time is important. The climate catastrophe is causing seasonal weather patterns to which our fauna is just not equipped. Our long scorching summer and fake autumn will impact many species well into the genuine autumn months and beyond. A hose pipe prohibition is currently in effect throughout Cornwall and sections of North and West Devon. Following that, Cambridge University researchers have developed fuel from fake leaves. Researchers have created floating artificial leaves that use sunlight and water to produce clean energy. The ultra-thin, flexible gadgets were inspired by photosynthesis, the process through which plants turn sunlight into food. According to researchers from the University of Cambridge, they claimed that experiments on the River Cam showed they could transform sunlight into fuels as effectively as plant leaves. It's envisaged that they would minimize the consumption of fossil fuels in shipping. According to the university, this was the first time clean fuel had been produced on water. It stated that if scaled up, the fake leaves may be employed on filthy canals, at ports, or even at sea and could help lessen the global shipping industry's dependency on fossil fuels, a problem that Professor Erwin Reisner's research group in Cambridge has been working on for several years. In 2019, they created an artificial leaf. However, it was bulky due to thick glass substrates and moisture protective coatings. They have just reduced the material's weight so they can float. Artificial leaves might significantly reduce the cost of sustainable fuel generation, but they're challenging to create at scale and transport since they're both heavy and delicate, said Virgil Andre of the university's chemistry department. We wanted to see how much we could minimize the materials used in these devices without affecting their performance, said Professor Reisner, who led the study. If we can reduce the materials to the point where they are light enough to float, it opens up entirely new applications for these fake leaves. And finally, why are the trees in the UK assuming it's autumn? The sound of crunching leaves beneath your feet and the magnificent foliage that has engulfed the trees may make you assume that fall has arrived earlier than normal. On the other hand, the scientists scientific community does not believe this seasonal change is accurate. This is a great example of what is described as a fake autumn. They believe that, due to the heat and dryness, trees are moving into survival mode and their leaves are either falling off or changing color to cool off. Some people may perish as a result of this. Lee Hunt, a chief horticultural specialist of the Royal Horticultural Society, feels that trees that develop an auburn tint and shed their leaves prematurely are stressed and closing up business. Although it may appear that autumn has come, he claims claims that the days are too long for those natural autumn processes to begin. Although it appears to fall today, the current season is referred to as a fake autumn, since the plants are not naturally reacting to the fall circumstances. He has lived in this area for the past 45 years and said that this year had seen some of the worst tree damage he has ever seen. Younger species, particularly those planted in poor soil near roads, are more likely to wither and die due to dryness than older trees, which may be able to withstand dry circumstances due to the massive root networks they have built through time. Well, that marks the end of our video for today. We hope you liked it. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button and thanks for watching.